Hello, everybody. Welcome into Debate Night. A little different look today. Uh, we're live, and uh, Hunter's yellow. Um, I'm official media. It's yeah, that's true. Uh, that's it, also why I'm wearing glasses. You do I have like my media bib and my like glasses. Clark I'm Kent. ready to report. And when you take sir. that off, it's like, oh my gosh, he's Super Hunter, the amazing disc golfer the whole time. It's, it's a perfect me. disguise. Um, today's episode is going to be a little different than normal. I'll get to explain that in a bit because we have everybody in person for Worlds, so we might as well take advantage. But before we get into all that, it's going to be a lot of fun. We have a quick word from the sponsor of today's show. All right. Have you guys ever gotten spam calls? If you're like me, you get them all the time, constantly, and they've gotten worse over the years. Not just the amount of spam calls I get, but they're getting more clever. They'll use area codes that look like they would be calls I would be getting from maybe my hometown or where I live. They've gotten smart at this thing, and they are super annoying. I mean, sometimes I'll literally leave the room, interrupt my life to try and answer one of these things just to realize it's a spam call. They are absolutely the worst. Now, I know one of the reasons I get so many spam calls is because big companies can't keep our data safe. Um, recently, AT&T revealed that nearly all their customers' call and text records have been exposed in a massive data breach. The stolen logs also contain a record of every number AT&T customers called or texted. So even if you don't use AT&T, if someone who texted you did, then your number has been exposed. So what can you do to protect yourself? That's where Aura, the sponsor of today's video, comes in. Aura will alert me if they find my phone number or any other sensitive information has been compromised, and they give me fast fraud alerts if anyone tries to use that data to access my credit card or bank accounts. Aura also does so much more to keep my family safe too. I get things like transaction monitoring, a VPN, antivirus, a password manager, parental controls, and identity theft insurance. You can get all this on one app at one affordable price. What I'm most excited about is their AI-powered call assistant that picks up unknown calls on my behalf to screen them for spam or scams. The AI forwards legitimate calls to me so I don't miss my appointments and emergencies, and it protects me from harmful text messages by filtering out known spam numbers and scanning links in the message for phishing threats. If you don't want to leave yourself or your family vulnerable to data breaches, you can go to Aura.com slash foundation and try out your first two weeks for free. It's also linked below in the description. That's Aura.com slash foundation. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this episode. All right, so tonight's episode going to be a bit different. Obviously, normally our show, everybody's remote, so we kind of take advantage of that and we, we uh, coordinate the show accordingly. Since everybody's in person, I decided let's make the show a little bit more conversational. Uh, makes sense since we can actually have a flowing debate tonight if it should arise. So what I did is I've gathered some topics. Um, nobody's got a script tonight, so it'll be very much improvised in that sense. I've given a little bit of insight into what we're going to be talking about. A lot of it, most of it, almost all of it, world related. I also had some of our uh, normal guest analysts give me some topics as well to discuss. Shout out Gary. He gave me a whole bunch of them. So uh, should be a good time. We're just going to get into it. Basically, I'm going to ask uh, one of our panel members a question, and then the other two have a chance to chime in. And we're just going to kind of go through these topics. And I do have to jump in here. Man, man of the people. people. Oh, yes. He's wearing the uh, shirt today. Man of the people have to jump in here. A lot of comments. We were getting a lot of comments. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. We're comment farmers. Um, that's what they say. A little bit of a war is happening in the comments now. Um, I think a lot of people were on board with the, the old, the uh, you know, commenting until blah 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 happens. Now there's there's up rival. There are people that are oh. against it. Oh, so now we have a big. That's the top comment. These commenting every week posts are the worst. It is the pinnacle of notice me please. So we're a little, there's a little battle in the comment wow. section right now. Shoot. The most heated debate is in the comments. We that's shall true. see who comes and prevails. Um, Someone else said, uh, which I think is kind of interesting, they said the scoring needs a revamp. So, yeah, well, this is a big revamp this week. So, there you there go. There is no scoring this week, but they're, they're, I will still win. There's, Greg Moore. There could be a I revamp my, with the, the live iteration of the show that we might favorite. test out. Cause I agree. I, I, I think it's, it's become too difficult to score in a way that, is random enough that I, I want it to be. And I think having the audience weigh into the score live would be really cool. So I think that's going to be something we're going to toy around with. And then we got to give a shout out to our members. Uh, Brody is 100% right about the par four versus par five question. The whole is the same regardless. That goes to the Bobby Shib. Shiz. Shout out, Bobby Shiz. Tour Life member. I mean, that's just one person. So TLC is what it is. Um, got to love it. All right. Well, I'll ask you the first question, uh, our first topic here. This this one, I believe, is submitted by a fan. Uh, is there a higher chance of a first-time Worlds winner or a repeat Worlds winner? I guess you could say for both FPO and Ooh. MPL. Which Ooh. is the higher chance if you had the 
So decide the probability, the Vegas odds, which one would be the favorite. Okay, well, FPO, easy, repeat. That's, that's easy. Is it? Yes, yes, yes. Just, be, just yes. because of Kristen? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'd say because there's only, what, two in the field? I would say, like, what? Three, maybe? Sarah? <laughs> Yeah, Sarah Holcomb. Uh, Holcomb. Maybe four. Page playing. Odd, a page playing. Yeah. shoes playing. A page shoes playing four. Yeah. There's about two of, really only one of relevance. I mean, the, the odds right now of who's going to win worlds Kristen. are in Kristen's yeah. favor yeah. by a lot. So you have to go with that is more likely than a, a new winner. Oh. On the MPO side, mm. um, ooh, see the MPO side's a little bit more interesting, I would say, um, because obviously you have Gannon who's playing the best right now who is not a world champion. Mm -hmm. And he probably, I would say, is the favorite, but not by much. Uh, we don't have lines in disc golf, but if I had a guess, I, I would say his line would be um, a little bit above a couple other people. Probably, you know? probably plus 300, plus 250 to win. I think higher than that, probably, honestly. Mm, probably okay. plus four. Okay. I think, because I, you got to look at it, with the way these courses play, like I don't love A-B in the super tight w trees in the middle of the fairway kind of courses, like Idlewild, Waco, those type. I don't like AB there. This course, I love AB at. At New London, obviously, and obviously at Ivy Hill. Uh, Isaac Robinson, past, cha past world champion last year. Yep. Uh, these courses are perfect for him as well. And I know some people are going to be like, oh, he doesn't throw that far. He throws plenty far. Stop saying that. Stop it. Uh, whoever you are. Cut it out. Um, <laughs> and then obviously you got the person that literally designed New London for his game. There's only like a couple holes out there that I'm like, this is not really a shot that Paul likes to throw. And it's like two holes. Every other shot's like, oh, straight putter, straight mid, straight fairway. Like these are all his bread and butter shots. So I like him there. The wild card to me, Simon was up. Yeah, yeah. I, I just heard um, there was That's someone in our store card. that said they claimed Simon shot 12 or 13 under during their practice round today in New London. The putter's working. He can, yeah, he can win anywhere. I, uh, I don't think we should be too shocked with double digits. I think no, before no. at New London, double yeah. digits is crazy. And we'd be like, what the heck? They neutered it. It's bad. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I don't I think do we think, should be shocked um, with it. I think MPO – the the probability I agree FPO I think MPO definitely the probability leans towards first time winner just because there's so many like really if you're thinking about previous world champions that are in contention this week you have Isaac Paul Ricky but then you have Gannon Calvin you know Ezra Aderholk again sneaky A B Ezra Robinson Simon Lazat Ezra Robinson you never you never know who's buckets. gonna show up. Joey Buckets. Like you don't know who's gonna pop off. And these courses don't play so specific of like only this player. This is a specialty. Like there's a lot of players that are gonna play these courses well. Chris Dickerson. Lefties will not well. win. Lefties, yeah, lefties are gonna struggle. Lefties will not win, and anyone that has a hard time throwing like a four hundred plus Heiser will not win. Has there been a lefty winner on tour this year? Has there been a lefty winner on tour ever? Uh, uh, the, well, maybe just, national it, tour, maybe Nathan Queen. Nathan Queen oh, tour championship. That's, that's, that's big the event. Big you count one. that, yeah. That's big event. The big one. Yeah, bracket. Yeah, I don't know, Robbie. What do you think? Yeah, I I, ju I think about like just power rankings in general of like how many. If you even go to y'all's like the grip lock power ranking, how many of those people are previous world champions? Yeah, it's the three. Uh, but the real statistic for me that kind of stands out is the fact that Gannon is four of five yeah. in four round events. That's big. Like, and some of those he's won by, I mean, the greatest one being the seven stroke win at European open. Like you give him another round to just continue to build that it's Gannon's gotta be, uh, yeah, the, the difficulty in beating Gannon out there, crazy. And I love, I, I'm a Calvin Heimberg stand through and through. Uh, I'm completely, biased in that if calvin's in contention on sunday i'll literally be rooting for so many people to hit rocks uh <laughs> like i according to hunter not looking great during the skins match it was just skins match just a skins match <laughs> yeah hey get the good hunter get the bad will, golf out now it will be interesting to see gannon though because he obviously has talked about learning to be more comfortable with throwing hyzers new london is not a flex course no it's not no. a flex backhand course no. he loves it though he does like the course i know he yeah. likes the course i'm just saying that is not his go-to shot yeah. yeah so it will be interesting yeah. to see how he plays out there um i'm not saying he's not gonna go out there and shred it i'm just saying that's not his go-to comfortable yeah. shot um 
But yeah, I mean, it's it's gonna be wild. It's gonna be, and it looks like the weather is gonna be great because I think yeah, I think Ivy, you know, playing it again this past uh, um, when I played on Monday, uh, you can kind of piece it around there pretty easily. Now, if you have an off day, you can definitely you can blow up. You can definitely mm-hmm. have a bad day, yeah. right? But there's a lot of scoreability out there when the wind is down. It looks like the wind is going to be down. So yeah. that's where it's just like, I don't know how crazy it'll get out there. New London, obviously, I think is where you'll see some of the score separating holes. So follow up question. So all of you seem kind of in consensus that FPO, there's a better chance of a repeat winner than a new winner, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah that was consensus. Would you, if, would you agree that... Of the repeat winners, you're really only factoring Kristen Tatar into yes. that percentage. Yes. Yeah, so then, my sure. question would be: If her percentage is higher than fifty percent, what do you? What would you? How high would you say her percentage is of winning this tournament? Seventy-five. I would 75? go eighty. I, was gonna, I literally was going to land right in the middle of seventy-eight. The, the only yeah, reason I'm not higher. She's only one for two on majors yeah. this year. The only, the, to me, the only reason I'm not because I, I these courses I think really favor the consistent thrower. And distance, or, and ju- yeah. Put it like that much. Yes, even FBA there, layout. Yes, there are people complaining in the the chat. I'm sorry, one for three on majors this year. There, yes. there yeah. are people complaining in the chat. Um, and uh, you, know, I haven't played the the FPL layout on. I, I, they're not complaining about New London, but there are holes on Ivy. They are complaining. We're gonna get about. to that. Oh, you're yeah, okay. We are gonna get yeah. to that. Yeah, uh, I did wonder. And that's what I'm just saying. I how think many, I think there's a couple people that would be in the top of our list of potentially I will, winning. I'll get to that. That now. are getting not okay. Yeah, because yeah. because Gary did write this down. This is a very interesting yeah. story because we don't hear about this a lot on tour, or at least it doesn't make it. I don't think like sure. out to the public. But uh, Gary submitted this. So Owen Scoggins in the press conference talked about the distance requirements at Ivy Hill being too much for a large portion of the field, and that it should be adjusted to allow more to have chances to reach landing zones. Hole 13 in particular was mentioned where she stated that you need at least 350 feet to get to when asked a similar question holland hanley said she finds it hard to sympathize with those sentiments because they are pros and should work harder to get that distance at this stage the world championships is it reasonable to expect the top fpo players to hit 350 foot shots or should we cater to the middle of the field and open opportunities for more players to reach landing zones i'm all for pushing it i mean when when you cater to the middle and lower part of the field we get u.s women's that gets complaints for everything else of this is too easy Easy, what is hole 13 whatever. again? It's the one that goes around the corner, if I'm not mistaken. It finishes up on that little hill. Oh, no, it finishes hill. up on that little hill. It's like, like behind, behind, a tree, a tree, behind a tree, it goes like up at the little hill. It kind of sits up there. You see from OB up on top, throwing down across the creek. Yeah. The next what? hole. The next hole is the one that's on the hillside, like... Yeah, it's all before that. Oh, downhill. Oh, so you are throwing. You're thro- you are throwing from out of bounds right. into inbound. Yeah. Yes, and it's like a 320 foot carry. But it's downhill too, I believe. If it's I'm a mistaken. little down, not from FPO. Not from FPO. Okay, FPO is kind of off to the right. Yeah, so okay. I'm not sure what he is. Yeah, but to me, I think that's a. I think Holland's point's fair. I think it's fair to feel like, but it, distance is a skill set. And it's not, to me, if this was 400 feet or 450, sure, that's pretty drastic. Sorry, guy. Right? But, like, if we're looking here, like, if it's realistically 300-some feet, Brody calls it 320, Holland said 350, if you're a touring professional that has a chance at Worlds, you better have that in the bag. Period. To me, like, that is a non-negotiable to me. So I understand course being too long and that, you know, bringing people out. I do think it should be a fair course, but I do think if we cater to the middle to lower half of FPO, like that's where you get to US women's where it gets shreddable and then you have a lot of complaints on the other side of it just like it muddies the waters. The world championship should be the best of the best succeed. And I think the distance is a part of the game. Yeah. I Robbie C is gonna take a set aside here. Robbie Crawford's gonna come out. Heck yeah. Uh in terms of Robbie Crawford's not as nice as Robbie C some days. Uh <laughs> professionals like we are talking about professionals and the tour has created this comfortability for so many people who have been doing it for so long of uh, this is my skill set it's just what it is and you're seeing it on MPO players are getting forced out you have players who have been doing this for 10 years they've been touring and they are realizing if I do not develop my skill set and for at some point it's too late for them to develop a skill set. Like, they're not going to find 150 feet more distance out there for their game. Steroids. So, <laughs> <laughs> there are, I guess there are medical ways to find 150 feet of distance. But, like, they're not doing that. And so, in FPO, you look at how Holland has climbed as fast as she has because she puts in the work. And she knows, I'm a professional. This is what is expected of me. So, yeah, 
I do think that if you're going to claim the world title, you should you should have all of the skill sets checked in order to do that. And I think that what's beautiful about these courses is people are not going to walk away and have a where everyone's questioning Greg Barsby as a world champion at 2018 because, oh, maybe it was a fluke. Okay, interesting. These courses are going to test every facet of your game. Let's let's make that the case. Like, mm -hmm. it's just – it's so infuriate. Like, I can get frustrated that I don't have distance. I'm not a professional. So I'm not going out there. It's not part of my work routine to try to grow that skill set. So my whining about not having distance should be white noise to the general public because there's paths to get there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, not, maybe not of your own and you're in your 40s, but definitely you've got yeah, some and players. I, and I think this was like actually a big issue back, you know, if we go back five years, go back maybe 10 years, where FPO was just playing the MPO layouts. Yeah. That's where you saw players like Paige Pierce, Katrina Allen, players that could throw a lot farther than everyone else. Mm -hmm. They didn't even necessarily have to play well because they could actually birdie every hole they played where there was people that were they were playing against that were their toughest competition, they can only birdie eight holes, ten holes. You're going to beat that person, regardless of whether you're playing good or not. So um, I, I think there is a level, there is a certain line of where it's like, hey, maybe a 450-foot par three for FPO is probably not a good idea if it's flat. Right. Maybe we should stay away from that. Um, 325 feet, 350 feet, no gap hitting, no ceiling. You can throw whatever shot you want. I think that should be a doable shot. I know some people were complaining and saying that they're just going like, to drop their disc off the uh, tee pad and go to the drop zone because they can't clear it. That's kind of soft. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I'm all for it. That's hilarious. <laughs> but this goes back to like my whole thing about like whenever I talk about why I want smaller baskets, it's, it's not just because I want putting to be harder, but it's also I want people that actually are good at putting and are putting well – to even separate more from the field. So if you think about it, imagine if we made the basket three times the size. That'd be awesome for me. If the basket was three <laughs> times the size, a great putter and a good putter, right. there would be very small difference between those. Yeah. yeah. Because if I'm make them all. <laughs> we're all trying to aim for the pole, the great putter hits the pole, goes in the basket, the bad putter, good putter, whatever, misses like two feet to the right. Guess what? On a basket that size, it's still going in. It's still counting. So like for me, the distance is the same thing. If we make the distance smaller at 250 feet, now, you know, if that's like, okay, we're not having a, we're not having any sort of like clearance more than 250 every fpo player can throw a hyzer 250 feet when you get to 350 now some players are going to have to flip stuff up and that is a much more difficult shot and some people aren't going to be executed and that's what i want to see who can execute it who can't i think with a hole like this the big question you know you hear the frustration but the big question is what percentage of the field actually can't reach it and can't reach it not Correct. It takes my best shot because that's completely different. It's a matter of can you reach it at all? And if 95 out of 100 players have the ability to reach it, then it's just at that point, it's totally fine in well, my opinion. It only becomes an issue if like a good majority of the field is just legitimately chucking it out of bounds. Well, what, yeah. are, we, what are we considering the 350 for MPO? What would be that distance for MPO? Uh, it's 450, so hard. 425, 450. It's 450, so hard in MPO though because like yeah. there's the distance disparity disparity isn't seen nearly as much. Right, like the, not anymore. Yeah, it used to be though. Like you don't have like the the top thirty players in the world. Obviously, there's players who have an upper, upper echelon, but like you don't have number thirtieth can throw three twenty five and number one can throw five hundred. Whereas an FPO, that could be true. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know it's so five hundred FPO, drastic. but yeah, no, there there is a bigger gap. I agree, and it's just because there is. It's the same thing of like. In FPO, if you're one of the top players and you have a bad week, you're still finishing in the top five. Yeah. If you're one of the top players in MPO and you have a bad week, you might not cash. Yeah, we've yeah. seen that literally. Right. Yeah. So yeah. like that's that is the big difference, and there just needs. It, it, and I love Own too, and you know she has every right to complain by all means. Does that mean she's right? No, but it, it, once we start seeing the gaps fill in MPO and FPO, then we won't really like you're saying like the we won't really care too much about what people are saying because it's like uh there's 60 people in fpo that can throw 350 well in my so, head everyone who has a shot at the title can throw 350 feet 
She's saying own doesn't. Own can. She can throw No, she can throw yeah. 350 feet. It's, yeah. just, it's just a tough shot for her. It might be farther for her, but I'm saying yeah. right. anyone in the field that can't throw 350, you're not you're not competing for yeah. the title. See, I, at I, one point, it I does think, become part of the I'm game. saying like can't throw, like yeah. flex yeah. shot, whatever. I think I would no, imagine is, 80% of the field can. We're filming this before tour life, so Missy might come on tour life and, and answer this in a way. We're also filming this before round one, so that's a fun Oh, oh this will come out after round one. We're filming oh, before. Oh, it's yeah. fantastic. So, so a lot of stuff's already happened yeah. that we well, don't know they're about. Playing, well, everyone's playing New, New London, London, so yes, it's yes. not. Yeah. But, uh, but, like, I honestly think from what I saw FPO players saying, two of the top players that I think have a chance to win Worlds, Missy and Owen, I think I'm, I'm, I'm Xing them out. Has no chance to win. Yeah, just because of the distance. Just because, yeah. So three rounds at Ivy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so speaking of three rounds at Ivy and the uh, venues in general, um, I wanted to ask this question because a lot of we've got a lot of feedback on the courses already. I think um, a lot of pros so far seem to like the courses. Some not as fond of as, of Ivy, uh, certainly as New London. So here's my question. I'll ask this to you, Robbie. Um, so if we were to ignore spectator accommodation and infrastructure, so we're just looking at the courses. Um, as they are, would Worlds be better if it were a reverse layout of two rounds at Ivy and three at New London, um, or is it good as it is, or would four rounds at just one of the courses be best? Um, how would how would that work out for you, ideally? Yeah, I, Ivy, I think when it was seen in the first temp layout, or I don't know what iteration of the layout it was that that flex start for battle or not flex start battle for Bedford mm -hmm. used it last. Yeah, um, I think Ivy in that layout. It is an easy decision. Switch them three at New London, two at Ivy, because I don't feel like it had the teeth that it needed to defend itself. It was a wide open Heiser Fest. Okay, now there is obviously the the challenge of the physicality that you're going to need to play at Ivy is just being overlooked, I think, by a lot of conversations what because, is that? like, so like the hills, elevation difference, yeah, walk and all of it, walking, yeah. yeah. It's a long I walk. I hate that take. <laughs> you don't think I, it's a hard walk? We play disc golf. We play disc golf. If you're, if you're struggling to make it 18 holes and throwing 36 shots, then you shouldn't be playing disc golf. I, Hit him with it. I'm not disagreeing, but I'm telling, like, from talking to pros during this week, it is, man, so grateful for the Soft. golf carts there. Like, <laughs> just laying it out there. I'm, I'm just saying that I hope no one – I hope this podcast doesn't go out to anyone else that actually plays other sports because, I mean, just imagine – the only time you ever hear that in golf is literally talking about Tiger Woods who has a broken leg. <laughs> Can he actually walk around the course? Like no one ever brings up, I don't know, man, this course is really hilly. I hope I have the stamina to make it. <laughs> it's so soft. It's so soft. You're fair, walking. To be fair, a good bit of pros do talk about Augusta mentioning that it is, it is kind of a hard walk. It's not, a hard walk, but that they're not saying, I hope I have the stamina to make it through the week. Well, right. I don't think anybody's going to DNF. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I'm not saying people. It just could be a factor. Not nobody's gonna like fall over on the course. But when they say it's a hard walk, they're also they're also literally talking about like some of the older guys that literally struggle walking. Like regardless of what they're doing, they struggle walk. I don't know. I, I've heard that take before when people are saying stuff of like, oh, it's gonna be tough. It's like, bro, you're you're we walking. Are a car you're guy throwing, now. I guess. You're walking. You're throwing shots. It's it's. Yeah, okay. it, it would be different if you're running up the hills. All that. All, yeah, yeah, or someone was or someone was tackling you. Like that could be pretty gruesome that and like tiring. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Pa with or without pads, you know? yeah, even course. the Olympics. Rugby here, baby. But I, yeah, I, I love the challenge that New London brings. I, it, it's hard to tell with the OB being removed on OB or on New London right now. I, I truly don't know which one's going to have greater score separation because you have a lot more technical greens it feels like at ivy and because of that that could bring in some scoring separation pretty dramatically but new london is requiring some te very technical shots so i personally it may be a lukewarm take but i'm kind of excited to see how it plays out in this layout so my vote would be leave it three at ivy two at new london if new london is going to be its current format and Ivy's in its current format. Fair enough. In terms I think, of OB shifts. First off, I it's so hard to remove the external aspects of the courses, right? Because like the spectator accommodations is such a big part of what's going to make. Because like 
one thing think about it in New London, regardless of how many you can fit out there, they can't wrap around the green the same way. They can't see it the same way. So just the optic of that, I think, is a big thing of a world championship. But if you were. But if I were, like, that's just, it's, it's hard for me to separate that. People in the trees. People in the trees. Yeah, how about this? It's, hard for it's me to COVID. It's COVID. <laughs> There's no spectators allowed. Yeah. So, but I, what I'm going to say is, I think that the addition of OB on 18 at New London makes it a very, in my opinion, would be a bad finishing hole for the world championship. And if I think of the stretch down the stretch of Ivy versus New London, I do think I favor the finishing stretch of Ivy score separation drama wise, just because like 17, is it a really tight green? Yes. Are you throwing from a long way in? Yes. Will that create drama, whether you like it or not? Yes. yes. Um, 18, I don't like really either 18, to be completely honest. I think that Ivy 18 is probably a better finishing hole for the world championship than New London. Um, so when I'm thinking of like coming in, I think I do favor Ivy in that sense. And from what I can tell, I, th I think that the scoring separation is going to be pretty similar in both. Um, so I, I don't know. It's a really, it's a really hard one. I don't think that I, here's what I, I think that the worlds will be, would have been received better by players. You would hear less complaining if there was three rounds at new London and two rounds at Ivy. Um, but I think a lot of the complaining is going to come from, I threw OB too many times at Ivy not legitimate complaints. Yeah. So the, a lot of that's going to fall on deaf ears with me. So I'm kind of up in the air. I think it's 50-50. I think, though, you do have to consider all of the factors we're trying to cut out, and that's what's like makes it a no-brainer. It's got to be at Ivy. My take on it is I've never been a fan of, like, increasing the amount of rounds. Um, so to me, I always thought worlds could be special by one making it the top 100 MPO players in the world, top 50 FPO players in the world. That's who gets to go. That's exclusive group. If you want to do top 150, top 100, whatever you want to do. But make it something like that, and those are the people that get go in. Not this guy, we haven't seen him on tour all year, and he's going to be out there playing, right? Yeah. It, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Second thing that makes worlds, or I, what I would like to see worlds be different than the others is it's the only major that is open and woods make the other uscgc open ob european open open european style or woods european style and that can bounce around from year to year and change and then champions cup i don't know what the heck they're doing there with otb but hopefully that goes back to like a wooded major right and then all of a sudden you have worlds where it's like you have both and if you did that I would have loved to see it for two rounds, two rounds, no advantage to anyone. Because right now, the way it's set up, there is a better advantage for some of the top thrower guys, you know, distance wise, because we are playing IV three times um, where I think if it shifted to New London, I think there would be a there would be a couple guys that would get thrown in the mix where you're like, oh, that's interesting that he's out there. Right. So to me, I would have loved to see it two rounds, two rounds. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure what I expected from that, but I think it is interesting, especially with New London being altered. I think that definitely changes things. Um, so, as we look at storylines for this event, anytime we get to the uh, major at all, especially worlds, there's always a number of storylines to look at. This question was submitted, um, I believe, also by Gary. Uh, which of the following would be the biggest storyline this weekend if it were to happen, and why? Um, number one, Calvin Heimberg wins his first major title. Uh, number two, Ricky breaks his major drought. Or number three, Kristen Tatar finishes off the podium. Um, Brody, what do you think? Which would be the biggest? I think it's Ricky, um, mainly because of how well he's playing this year. So I think people are kind of, you know, there was high expectations for him going into the European Open. He fell just a little short of that. So I think, I think that would be the big story coming away would be him finally winning again since it's been such a big, uh, you know, Calvin just hasn't been having a great year as far as winning go yeah. going. And, and, and some of his tournaments, he's kind of fallen off a little bit, to be honest. So um, that's what I think. Okay. I'm, I'm also going to go with, with Ricky, Ooh. mainly because um, I think that the drought at this part in his career and how good he's been through the last seven years without a major – um, I think there's more tension around that drought than the Calvin drought, in my yeah. opinion. I think the Calvin drought, it, it almost, it, to me, it almost does feel inevitable that Calvin will get one. I think that once Calvin gets another three, four years down the road, then there's a lot of tension on that drought of like, is he, is he just going to end his career without any majors? Ricky's at an interesting point right now where he has one of like a very phenomenal Hall of Fame level career. 
but his major accolades holds him from that next echelon. And if he doesn't start picking him up now, he's not going to have enough majors left in him to get to that next echelon. He would if he won a, you know, a bunch, but I'm saying like statistically... He hasn't won a major in the new era. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. there, There's a lot... Of, that major means a lot to Rick, I think. And so that, to me, tier list, I think it goes Ricky winning number one, Calvin winning number two, Kristen finish off the podium number three. Because I just feel like a, a Ricky world's win would hit a lot harder than a Calvin first major. I just think there's more tension around that storyline. Yeah. I think the Kristen finishing is the the lowest one by far. Just even thinking about like when we're when we're discussing the inevitability of Kristen winning this major, it doesn't feel inevitable because I mean we saw fourteen stroke swings in one round. Right, so yeah. like if that happened and Kristen had a fourteen stroke swing in the last round and ended off the podium, we would just be like something oh, we haven't that's seen. FBO. Right. Uh, like so I think that one definitely ranks lower. I'll make my argument for Calvin. I expected, I think, I, I expected I, I you all to expect that. Well, I thought yeah. everybody would say Calvin, honestly. I well, really did. No. Hey, first major for maybe the, the best player of the last few years. Yeah. yeah, but like Gannon has really taken a huge jump into that the last couple months. And then also, like Paul and Ricky have, you know, they just had that nice little battle back and forth. Paul's won, I believe, two majors in the new era. Right, worlds and worlds USCGC. And USCGC. And Three, Rick, if you consider his 2019 worlds. I don't think that's quite the I don't new think era. That's the new but, era, yeah. Uh, but um, on the border. But yeah, so like that. I think to me, that's where it's like Rick probably is still looking at that. Yeah. Head yeah. To Let's head. hear Calvin's argument. Yeah. So Calvin, I, go ahead. I, I agree with the Rick arguments in terms of the longevity of it, and I mean, truly, what 2018, 2017 17, was Rick's. 17, yeah. yeah. 17 so worlds. we're talking. We are talking. Most modern fans haven't seen Ricky be the Ricky that we all discuss. Like it's it's almost when we talk about 2015 Paul, to me that like enigma of a player is how we view Ricky. And then there are moments where Ricky pops off and does his thing. For me, Calvin, I guess the bigger storyline is we know Ricky has done it before. We know like there is no there's a monkey in terms of he hasn't done it in the new era. But, okay, if Ricky breaks the streak, what happens next? Does he go off and win a bunch more? Eh, I don't know. But Calvin, we have this, like, feeling of every single time he's getting to a final round in a major and he just completely falls apart, completely comes up short, whatever it may be. And so I think him getting that one solidifies, okay, I can do it. I know how to win. That feels great. But I also think another side of it that brings it great for Calvin is right now, Innova doesn't have a major like representation in terms of major winners. And so I'm, I'm wondering from a, from a security standpoint, from a comfort standpoint, like Calvin getting that major title, how much more of a boost does that give him in Innova conversations? How much more of a boost does that give him in just career like movement? I do, yeah. I do feel like it. I, I think both of them. It's a. It's a definitely a legacy argument. But I. I personally think it's. It would be bigger for Calvin's legacy to win a major this year than it would be for Ricky's to win a major. Because I think there. I think is, it'd be bigger for his legacy. I don't think it'd be as big of a storyline though. I think it'd have a bigger long term impact career wise. But I think immediate hit, the Ricky would just. Like I said, there's just more tension around Rick to me. So, I'll I'll pose this then. If Calvin wins, let's say Calvin wins here, Ricky wins USCGC, or vice versa. How long of a window afterwards for both of them are you looking at, like, okay, we need them to win again? Like, if Ricky won this a major this year, does he ever need to win another major? It depends on where he wants his career. Does he need to? No, because I think it is important of... What's the need? need to, what's the need? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think I think like, for Ricky, for Ricky, there he has major history. It's more so like, can he do it against this field? And it's been so long. Calvin needs it to to really establish himself in that like Hall of Fame question, even because like he's had a he's had a good few years, yeah. But like, you know, disc golf Hall of Fame. Obviously, there's a bunch of questions around it. But like, winning a major definitely is one of the things. Like, if you want a Hall of Fame career, you're gonna have to win a lot on the Pro Tour to go major list. He can't win in a my big opinion. one. And so that's always going to be the question for, for Calvin. So yeah. um, I think career impact, especially if Calvin were to win Worlds, because I know historically 
Anovo doesn't feel like a company that changes their ways super drastically or super often. Yeah. So I would imagine their contracts are pretty similar to when I've talked to people that, that would know Innova contracts. Um, winning Worlds for Innova player is life-changing, like yeah. big-time life-changing. Yeah. Calvin's is obviously already a little different because typically one of the things that comes with it is your name on a disc. He has that on the Toro from Pro Tour wins. But a lot of times there's some like hefty bonuses that come, especially if you can rattle off a few in a row and stuff. So like, I mean, even his, his livelihood would change. Ricky, it's more so just his legacy's on the line. The, yeah. the longer he goes, the longer it's just, you know, Ricky could, Ricky is, you know, it is what it is. So, yeah, definitely two players to watch. Um, now, a lot of times we do talk about the favorites, but I want to know from y'all, what are, what is, who is one top FPO player and top MPO player that just maybe based on recent events or the way the courses are shaking out, are they, who are two that you're looking to see underperform, not looking to see, looking forward to, but you think could underperform at this event that are on your radar for that? Uh, Owen Scoggins, I think, comes to mind just because they're even with the OB on New London being gone on the first three holes. I know we always get in trouble when we say we refer to her as a forehand player. People are like, oh, they don't watch FPO. They haven't seen her backhand. Yeah. She prefers a flex forehand, whether you like it or not. For sure. Um, and so that is going to be her preference. And that there's a several holes that, that just isn't going to work as well. And there's a lot of holes that you do need distance to play. Um, she'll be she has enough distance, but it's just. What she's going to have to throw to get to landing zones, I don't think are going to be consistent. And there's just certain courses where it's like everyone's going to have a lot of looks. The putter wins. I think this is only the throwers are going to have a lot of looks. And the putter gets neutralized there. Because it's like Owen will be able to capitalize on the looks she gets. I just don't think she's going to get nearly the same amount of looks as an Evelina Salonen to where Evelina's putter can be at 60% and her score looks similar to Owen's. Mm. Um, MPO is, is a tricky one, man. Um, and who's going to underperform there? You know, a lot of it to me isn't going to come to the courses because I think the top MPO guys can play their can play both these courses very well. I think it is going to come to the pressure of the World Championship, and um, you know, I'm gonna go with Calvin. I think I think it's just going to be too much. I, too I much. think that I think the first few rounds going to be very important to him. I think he's got to get out and put himself in in contention. Um, and I think when you think of expectations of like realistically. If he doesn't win here, that's a loss in the public perception too. Of like, it just adds to the storyline. Um, so I, I'm expecting I'm expecting that to to just based on history be a bit be too much. I feel I feel like the worst possible thing for Calvin at this point in majors. It's like it's one thing if he goes out, just kind of sits in the middle of the pack. But if you get him, if he gets himself into contention, into yeah. the ooh, can Calvin do it? And then at that point, blows it or just can't get the win. Like that's where it's tough. No, yeah, yeah. Robbie, what do you think? Yeah. I think my FPO is I think Evelina. It, I I'm gonna I think Evelina doesn't even make top ten this week. Oh, oh man! Uh, I Jeez. think I All right, think, shut it. I think she wow. doesn't make top ten. <laughs> I for the exact things you're saying on the pressure. Yes, she has a win at Champions Cup. Okay. Who's beating her? Spectators at Northwood Black. Oh, you think spectators are getting to her? I think I think. Oh, the, you actually uh, think his take was crazy? Yeah. Let me be clear. I thought you were being sarcastic because I thought you were just saying like, "Oh, that's crazy." Like FPO is no, so ridiculous. Like, uh, <laughs> you no. actually surprised. I was really trying to think of ten <laughs> people that are going to beat her. I people that can make putts within fifteen feet. I don't think putting is going to matter that much uh, for FPO this this weekend. I, I think I think throwing it in bounds and keeping it in the fairway is going to matter more than anything. And while while I agree with that, imagine walking like round one she comes out and she misses 15 footers that is so shattering to comp like all it takes is one round of her having her putt off and all of the fear and terror comes right back at her of the whole story that was last year the whole story that was the year before what if she, what if it's all back none of it worked when you start having woes i don't care if putting supposed to matter or not no tap in is close enough when you can't putt uh, well, we I, saw that at the the European festival in the playoff. I, I know oh that's my. what I'm saying. She she hasn't been putting well. No, she hasn't, and it hasn't and she, it hasn't mattered, mattered in a lot of tournaments. Yeah, she won. <laughs> she hasn't been play, putting well at all. And the on the only t she's only finished. Yeah, it's tough. She's only finished outside the top ten once, and she has Could not be been putting well. Robbie thinks she's making hey, it twice. All right, it's happened. 
It's on the table. We, we, we asked for people the beliefs that were underperforming. It's so true. I, yeah, I, it's I not, believe. No, it's not a bad. It's not a bad pick because there's not that many to pick on the FPO side. There's yeah. only a handful that you can actually say right would underperform. Would underperform. Yeah, true. Because so many of them, like you can't say I think Haley King's going to underperform. Yeah, yeah, because what, what is that? Yeah, what does that, that even correct? mean? Paige yeah. Pierce. What does I, that, I, what I does that mean? That yeah. mean? Yeah. You, you really <laughs> can only pick. There's only like five yeah. FPO players, really. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, I think I'm going to go. Oh, you didn't say MPO. 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 I'll I'll keep the hot takes coming. I don't think Isaac Robinson. I think he underperforms this week. I think. Okay. That what is the underperformance for him? Uh, we'll say doesn't make top ten. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. That's like just underperforming. That I would, would say. be just underperformance. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll, I'll stretch you to go top fifteen. Now you're out of your okay. mind. Yeah. Now you're I out of your just, mind. I, I my glasses. Burn I him. Think about, I think about, right, like, the man is, he's favored in the woods courses, just like Brody said, of he's going to, he he throws far enough. Like, Ivy's not going to be that much of a disadvantage for him. He's He's got all that. He's good. I was very impressed at how far he threw when we filmed with him. I, thank him you. Him and his brother. Thank you. Ezra, they both, yeah. Yeah. they both got some distance. Turns out pros just, when you throw as hard as you can, like, 24 7 for an entire tour you're you start to throw far Who knew? those Who guys knew? can rip uh, <laughs> yeah i i think the best thing that can happen for isaac's game this week because he mentioned in press conference defending champ like he that is on his mind is man what like how's that gonna go i feel it back to back uh like that's that's huge we we have not seen back-to-back -back winners in mpo in history there's what three or four climo paul Great ricky question. I don't think Barry ever did. I don't know if Barry ever went back to back. I don't think he did. Yeah, and Dawson didn't do it. Like no. what I do know is, if we say something wrong here, Gannon Burr will screen record it, and Perfect. he will tell us later. So Perfect. That's true. And man, it would be Maybe cool to show. see another person join the back to back club. I think the best thing that can happen for Isaac's game is that Ezra goes crazy this week, and that they can go back to what everyone who golfs in the Southeast has felt, and that's when the Robinson brothers show up, and they are both playing hot. Watch outfield like they are because that brother, brother rivalry. rivalry just takes off, and at that point maybe it can kind of Who's the dim brother? the lights. Is Isaac, Isaac, Isaac's the little brother. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know. At being a little brother, watching your big brother do something, there is nothing lights a competitive fire in you. Like that would that. be a sick, uh, sick duel. The the brothers, the bros, the, stretch the Robin bros. So top fifteen and top ten. Okay. Wild yeah, the interesting. You guys mentioning him throwing far, and I've been saying it forever because so many people are like, "I oh, can't win." He doesn't throw far enough. He got fourth at Portland Open this year. I mean, Portland Open's <laughs> yeah. the longest course we play yeah. by a mile, yeah. and the guy got fourth. Yeah. So everyone, calm down. Uh, FPO, I'm gonna go again. Like I said, we're picking from five five players, right? I I don't think Kristen is gonna underperform. I think she's gonna win or be right there in winning. Um, I think Owen is going to probably finish where she probably should finish, which is like a top five. Uh, probably won't have a chance to win, though, because of the distance. Um, and then I think Evelyn will be in the mix, but probably too far out. But I, I think the person that I think we're all kind of expecting that has the best chance to maybe push Kristen is, is Holland. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go, and I, th I think Holland's going to have one bad round at New London. That really puts her behind the eight ball. Mm. Um, I think there are a couple holes out there that do require a decent sidearm off the tee. We have seen in the past that sometimes her sidearm just goes away from her and she can't get it back. So I'm going to go, go with Holland um, just because, again, I think there's only a couple people you can name. Yeah. You got to name someone. Uh, prove me wrong. Uh, MPO side. Um, MPO side so tough though. Very. So tough. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna say Gannon. Ooh. Oh. Hang oh. on. I think. Say, well, to be fair, I think performing him in. Under, yeah, outside top ten. No, I think outside under. Top five. I, I think underperforming is not in contention to win on Sunday. Yeah, I think I that's agree. underperforming. It's, uh, tough to have that. So it could it could <laughs> he could literally finish fifth and have it underperformance by not having a chance. To I mean, all I mean, eyes are not on wrong. Him. Yeah, you're really not wrong. It's not, when you're playing like, this it's well, safest, it's kind of the safest bet. I mean, his average finishing place is in the top five. It's like three point eight. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Almost in top three. I think if I think if he doesn't have a chance to win you know if it's six on hole 16 and everyone's like he can't win i think everyone's gonna be like he didn't he didn't have a good he didn't time. do it yeah that's fair so that's fair tough to live up to that but true all right well that's all i've got um 
great little world's discussion there. I think can we can we do a little? Uh, sorry to yeah. throw a wrench. No, you can in do whatever you want. Can we just do uh, the flip side for MPO of a player maybe not on the radar we expect to overperform? Yeah, we sure can. Just because I have one. Yeah, no. Uh, Chris Dickerson, very I, sneaky. I know you too well. I, what, I, I was surprised. What does that mean? Overperform to? Like I think the, he has a chance to win. I think Chris Dickerson has a very real chance to win out here on these. But courses. he's been having an incredible season. Just no one's talking about him. We yep. are. So you're saying he's like under the radar. Exactly. Because I don't think that would be overperforming. Because I think as overperforming to people's expectations. I think, I think Ezra, a lot of people would be Ezra surprised. Ezra Robinson's probably by, another player like that. Yeah, I know. think a lot of people would be surprised by a Chris Dickerson win here. I'm just saying, you listeners, don't be. I think happens. people. Don't I bet people would say Ezra Robinson has has had a better season than Chris, which I don't think is true. Uh, well, I was he, just having this conversation. Well, Chris didn't with play as many tournaments. That's really yeah. the difference. But, but what I'm saying is, I think people quickly who's who's had a better season, Ezra or Chris. I think everyone would say Ezra yeah. way pretty better. Similar. And Chris, Chris yeah, is pretty a, similar. a really good. Season. I was just having this conversation with someone like literally less than an hour ago of the weight of expectation on a player alters your perception of their season so much because Isaac and Ezra Robinson have both been having a really good season, but Isaac feels like he's having a much worse season to me than Ezra just because of my expectation going into the year. Chris mm. Dickerson similar where like you expect them to perform at a level. I didn't expect Ezra to perform at the level he is. So even though he's right in the mix with them, you instantly feel like, oh, Ezra Robinson's having a much better season than Chris Dickerson or Isaac Robinson. When it's like, well, if you look at stats, that's not fully true. They're they're pretty neck and neck yeah, in a lot of areas. Close. Yeah. So Chris Dickerson's my pick, though. Okay. Uh, and Gossage. The Goose. Oh, the Goose. I think I think Goose, Goose returns to the form that took Paul McBeth to a playoff. Greatest, greatest whole six drive we've ever seen in Yeah, I was telling Brady about it. Absolutely bonkers. We got it on camera. Don't By the way, see it. the story is that Kevin Jones, I don't know, was he playing skins, Kevin Jones? No. Okay, well, then maybe it was a practice round. Um, or no, it was, it was, it was mixed doubles. Uh, mixed so doubles. our guy Jonah was out there spotting. Nice. Hole seven. He hit oh, oh. on the island in one and then skipped and, like, kicked off. But he landed originally wow. on oh, the island. Yeah, We always thought it was possible. Who? His, like, like the low right side. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Jones. Jones. The low, like, oh. right side that's closest, but he had gotten over the rocks. Crazy. <laughs> I always wanted to see that someone That is it. bananas. That's, that's bananas. Yeah. yeah. I just think Goose has both sides of it. Like, I th- yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think we were talking about the, the shot that Goose had on six, and it's like. It's nuts. I honestly think your best chance to play hole six the best is if you've never played it before. Yes. You don't know. Yeah. You don't Correct. have the memories. Because when he threw it, we're like, huh? Because <laughs> we, we just played around, and he's been out here with Ezra playing these courses for days. Yeah. And he threw a shot, and I was like, oh, I hope that doesn't skip to the left. He's like, it's impossible to go left. And I'm like, what? <laughs> On your tee shot? Yeah. I'm like, no, it's not impossible to go left. It's, it's very easy. It's to go left. very easy to go left. He's just never gone over there. Yeah. So he thinks it's impossible. Yeah. Right. You saw it off a little bit. It gets a little skippy skip off the, yeah. you know, dirt, and all of a sudden now you're pitching out. So yeah. Yeah. it's almost like one of those holes where it's like the the, the, the least experience you have. The correct. Better. The better that you just go out there and you just rip a shot and you're like, oh, this hole's not that bad. Um, overachieve. I'm gonna go FPO. Okay. Okay. Give me cat merch. What? Oh, okay. give me cat merch. I love it. Oh, Kogan. I just, I think there's the just gonna rope. be a couple people that you know three rounds at Ivy. As long as they don't blow up at New London, there's just gonna be a couple people that you know. Just kind of chip away. Yeah, chip away and kind of beat yeah. a lot of people that are probably you would say are having better. a better They're season pushing. or better just because they can throw far. And uh, yeah, I think I think if she can keep the disc in bounds at Ivy, I think she can actually okay. love it. Score I haven't heard much from Cameras this year exactly. so far. Um, all right, well there you go. There's a little bit of world's insight, a little bit of a different episode. Uh, let us know if you enjoyed this. Obviously, different because it's worlds. We have everybody in town. Not our normal format. If this is your first time watching the show. Watch a different episode. You'll see how it normally uh, plays out. But next week should be back to our our normal format, and hopefully we will see you then. Thanks for watching.